Hello, Feminine Roadmappers. It is Gina here, and thank you so much for joining me on Feminine Roadmap Inspires. Today, I have a really great historical story for you. Today, I'm speaking with Stephanie Nauman. She is the professor of management in the Eberhardt School of Business at the University of the Pacific. She is also the author of How Languages Saved Me. This is the story of how her grandfather, Taddeus Tad Haska, used his knowledge of nine languages to survive before, during, and after World War II. And I thought, how inspiring would it be to hear a real historical story? So Stephanie has taken what her grandfather had recorded, and she has finished his story and put it in this book. So I'm so excited to have you with us today, Stephanie. Thank you so much for saying yes. Thank you, Gina. I'm really happy to be here. So why don't you go ahead and just begin. Tell us the story of how you decided to even pick up the story and finish it and put it into book form. Right. So growing up, I heard countless people tell my grandfather, you must publish this story. I, as a little kid, I wasn't too interested in history, unfortunately. And I'd be at family gatherings and social events, and I would notice a small crowd gathering near my grandfather. And I would hear people say, tell us more, tell us more. What happened in World War II Poland? How did you escape Poland? How did you get your wife with you? And, and all these kinds of questions. So even though I didn't know the details as a kid, I knew there was something important because my whole life, I heard people tell him, you must publish this story. This is beyond your family. Other people need to hear about this story. So he started writing his memoir in the 1990s, and I was helping him with that somewhat. I was transcribing his uh, handwritten documents, and he would, um, we were living in different states at the time, and he would mail me these manually typewritten pages. He had a manual typewriter, not even an electric typewriter. <laughs> and so that was great. So I was the one transcribing them. We talked once a week and, and he was working on it. He worked on it up until um, his passing in 2012. So uh, after his passing, I had kind of put it out of my head for a while. Um, I had lost my mother two years ago. And mm -hmm. after her passing, I was cleaning out the garage and found boxes and boxes of these video recordings, these audio tapes, uh, my grandfather's personal diaries, and all of these recordings were interviews of him talking about his life. So I was so excited. I realized I have enough information here to finally realize his dream of publishing this book. Even though that he's gone, I can still put it in his own words because he's being interviewed about his life. So that was really exciting for me. That is such an amazing thing. That's like finding a treasure, isn't it? Yes, yes. So each, incredible. Each box was, it was like a piece of a puzzle. I would put one, uh, these were old, you know, VHS uh, tapes into this old uh, VHS recorder I happen to still have. <laughs> My husband and I would just be sitting at the edge of our seat listening to him tell these stories. And each audio recording contributed something that was not in the others. Uh, so for instance, the videotape that I can remember most was my husband and I were watching and my grandfather was telling the story exactly how he got arrested by the Soviet secret police. It was a great story. We're on the edge of our seat. And then at the end of the story, he said, and then I escaped from this jail in a very dramatic way. And then he moves on to the next story. <laughs> and so I was so disappointed. I was thinking, I need to know exactly how you got out of this jail. What's the story there? And fortunately, I opened up another box in the garage, and there was the rest of the story that I had been waiting for. So it really felt like he was uh, guiding me even uh, from the grave because um, each, each box was like a different piece of the puzzle. Awesome. So why don't you tell us a little bit about your grandfather and his story? Yes. So my grandfather was born in 1919 in Mikołajki, Poland. He, uh, his early years, he talked about it as being pretty good. His parents were actually um, owners of a dairy, and it was actually pretty profitable. They had eight children at the time, and he and his brother, unfortunately, his younger brother, Antoni, were the only ones to survive childhood. So all of the younger siblings passed away of mm. some childhood diseases. And when my grandfather was 12, he lost his father. When he was 13, he lost his mother. Wow. So amazingly, these two boys at the ages of 13 and 12 lived completely alone. 
They didn't tell anyone. Eventually, one teacher in the school found out. She arranged for them to have free tuition at the school to help them out. But those boys were totally on their own, living in a one-room apartment, uh, making money, um, doing various things. Even at that young of an age, my grandfather was using his knowledge of languages. He was tutoring other children who were not applying themselves in school and making extra money that way. By the time they graduated high school, they had burned all of the furniture in their apartment just to keep warm. So very difficult time. He had a full scholarship to university. He was excited. He was going to be a teacher of languages. So this was in 1938. Had a wonderful first year of university. He shows up for second year of university, September 1st, 1939. And as we know, that was when World War II began. So Germany invaded Poland and his college career ended in an instant. And mm. the book really takes off from there. It's about how he used his knowledge of languages to survive World War II. He would um, translate newspapers to farmers. So you have to remember these farmers were, were used to getting newspapers in Polish to find out what was going on. Now the Nazis have occupied Poland, so everything was in German. So my grandfather would translate these newspapers to let people know what was going on. He even translated uh, job instructions to these French prisoners of war, <laughs> which got him in trouble. And he even used his knowledge of languages to impersonate a Nazi soldier on occasion to stay alive. Wow. Lots of uh, language stories during the war. <clears throat> How did he learn so many languages? You know, that's a good question. Um, he, he picked up so many. I know he was taught French, Latin, and some German in school before, before he went to university, but he was studying them in, in the university. And I think he's one of those people that just picked them up really quickly. That's I amazing. wish that rubbed off on me. <laughs> right? That would be amazing. I always thought it would be so amazing to just make it easy to just speak another person's language. Right. Right. That would be awesome. <laughs> So what was one of the more interesting stories or one of the stories, I know they're probably all very interesting. Tell us a little bit of the story so that the audience kind of knows what it is that you're sharing. Yes. So uh, one of the stories during the war about how languages saved him and languages also sometimes got him in trouble. <laughs> he was um, he was working at a farm translating uh, job instructions to these French prisoners of war. And things went okay for, for some months like that until one day one of these French prisoners of war decided to put a rock in a piece of machinery that was, um, it was some piece of farming equipment that was pretty critical to this, um, this farm that was now occupied by Germans. And these French prisoners of war, when they were asked by the German farmers who did this, they said, oh, it was Ted, he told us to do this. My grandfather, the translator, which was completely not true. <laughs> And so the, immediately the, the farmer who was, who was pretty good to my grandfather, but said, this is not gonna end well. This farming equipment is critical to the German economy. You know, I have to, I have to notify the Nazis and things are not going to end well for you. So, fortunately, my grandfather was able to uh, be saved. So he had, um, the farmer had the Nazi over to come arrest my grandfather. And the farmer kind of stalled him and said, you know, let's have dinner first and let's have some drinks. And the guy became so drunk that he said, I'll come back in the morning and pick this guy up. Um, I'm going to take this ham home to my wife and, and, and I'll be back in the morning. So my grandfather used that opportunity to escape. He actually impersonated a Nazi soldier to board a train and get out of there. Wow. So that was one of my favorite stories. So he stayed in Poland then? He stayed in Poland during the war, right. Uh, after the, so he did survive the war in Poland. After the war, he went to a coastal town called Darwowo, where he was uh, becoming a teacher of Polish, finally able to realize his dream of teaching languages. He met my grandmother there. They got married. For a couple of months after the war, things were really ideal. Until one day, his friends encouraged him to run for political office. So he was running on the democracy ticket against the communists. So if you remember, so January 1946, there were supposed to be these free and unfettered elections in Poland. Poland was finally going to be able to decide, are we allowed to be a free and independent Poland? So my grandfather was, of course, for that, and he was pro-democracy. 
He was arrested pretty quickly by the Soviet secret police once they found out he was running for office. They figured, who's going to vote for this guy if he's in jail? So they put him in jail. So the book has a great story about how my grandfather was able to escape from this jail from the Soviet secret police. He makes it all the way to Sweden. Once he's in Sweden, he realizes, okay, I made it to Sweden, I escaped jail, my poor wife is still back in Poland, what, I'm gonna, what am I gonna do? Again, his knowledge of languages saved him. He learned another language, Swedish, had no Swedish knowledge at that time. Um, spent many months learning the language, um, took a lot of time to get a Swedish passport, which was only supposed to be for Swedish citizens. He needed that Swedish passport to get a job as a sailor to smuggle my grandmother. So he ends up going back to Poland on an all-male Swedish ship, smuggles her in a coffin on the ship, and gets her back to Sweden. That is amazing. What an ingenious grandfather you had. <laughs> he really was. He really was. So now yeah. how old was he when World War II hit? Uh, so he was 20. He was 20. In 1939, he was 20. Yes. Wow. Yes. Wow. So now how did he utilize the languages to navigate to America? Because he came to America yes. at some point, did he not? Yes, yes. So life was... was pretty good for them in Sweden for a while. They were intending on staying there, uh, but my grandmother in particular had horrible nightmares that someone was going to come back to arrest her husband. So every morning she was waking up screaming. And so uh, my grandfather decided this, this is not going to, this work, we're just not far enough away from the people that are trying to get me. So um, they ended up planning to immigrate to New York. And to do that, he had to learn English. So he ordered some lingua phone records of the English language. It's a company that teaches you English uh, by uh, playing the same record hundreds of times. And so that was the methodology he used. He said, I would be um, taking a bath. I would be playing the record. I'd be doing the laundry. I'd be playing a record, eating dinner, or playing the record. And that's how I learned English to be able to make it over to the U.S. And he used some of these methods of learning English uh, in his own teaching because he became a teacher in uh, Monterey, California at the Defense Language Institute. So he taught uh, Polish to soldiers for 35 years using some of these same techniques that he, he learned back in Sweden. Yeah. What a brilliant mind. And records. That's so funny. You're talking about records. I mean, they're back, right? Records right. Back. <laughs> yeah, they're a lot more expensive now. <laughs> I know. They were cheaper the first time when everybody so. had a stereo. I think so. so just give us a little bit. I don't want you to give away the book, obviously, but kind of sure. give us an overview of how your grandfather, you know, worked in his mind and, and kind of give us an overview of his journey. Yes. Uh, perseverance is the biggest thing. I, I think that's the biggest takeaway for me of, 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 reading and hearing his story in his own words. Uh, he just never gave up. I think a lot of people would have given up <laughs> when they were in his shoes, uh, but he just never gave up. Always wanting a better life for his wife and later his daughter, my mother, uh, just he was strongly motivated by wanting a better life for his family, never giving up. So he, he was 20, he got one yeah. year of college in, and then he stayed in Poland for all of World War II? Yes, he said he was like a rabbit, always moving from place to place during the war to stay alive. Um, the Nazis were very good, as you remember, of, of taking um, records and lists. So they kept very good track of what your name was, where you lived, what your occupation was. So my grandfather decided it would be good to make sure I'm never on one of these lists. <laughs> So he would make friends with um, a few Polish people that happened to be working in these census taking places. And he would say, let me know next time they're going to do a list. I'm out of here. <laughs> so he said, sometimes it was better to be living in the country where there was plenty of food available during the war. Other times it was safer in the city, but he always stayed on the run. He also stayed alive by uh, removing his eyeglasses during the entire Nazi occupation. Because remember, intellectuals were just a huge enemy of of the Nazis because it was feared that if Poles were smart, they might rise up and speak up and challenge what the Nazis were trying to accomplish. So he had to always keep his glasses off. The few times he accidentally put them on, he got in trouble. 
Are you serious? Just from eyeglasses? Yes, yes. Because they said, what are you doing here? You don't look like the other farmers, you know. Do you know how to read? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Who would have thought that wearing a pair right. of glasses? Because really, glasses are just an ability, just to help you to I see. Doesn't mean you're smart, but apparently <laughs> that's how he was perceived, and he was. Interesting. So he would literally just move the whole war? How, how long did he stay in a place? Like, what well, was his typical yeah. pattern? I think the very longest he stayed in a place was 11 months at, at the very last farm that he was at, um, the last farm. But usually um, just month, one month at a time here and there. Wow. Yeah. And this is in a small country. Yes, yes. Another way that he was able to travel was um, he, the Germans always wanted you to have a piece of paper if you were Polish that said you're going home because they thought we can allow Poles to travel if if they're going to their place of residence, because then we can keep track of them better when they're at home, we have records on them. So he had a piece of paper that said he was going home and he used that as long as he possibly could. Whenever he was stopped, he would say, oh, I'm going home, I'm doing, I'm doing what you told me, I'm one of the good guys. But actually he was not going home, <laughs> he was trying to, trying to stay away. And he was an orphan, he really had no home. <laughs> Where was his brother during all of this time? So his brother also was uh, on the run during the war, uh, working at various farms, um, staying on the move as well. His brother was actually an artist. He was studying art before the war. Of course, all universities were closed during the war, but after the war ended, he became a famous artist in Poland. Oh, did he? That's he fascinating. Did. What is his name? Antoni Haska. Yes. Antoni Haska. And during their early years, I didn't mention when they were orphans and my grandfather was making money by tutoring the other kids, Antoni was actually, you know, at the age of 12, selling some of his artwork. He was painting postcards. He was um, making sculptures out of gypsum and selling them. So even at a really young age, there was that art in him. Are they, now, did they remain close? Did his brother follow him? He did not come to the, he did not immigrate to the United States, but they did stay close all those years, talk regularly on the phone. Uh, my grandfather visited Antoni in Poland um, uh, maybe six to 10 times um, in the later years, uh, but Antoni only came to the US one time. He never, um, he didn't speak English, and so he didn't feel comfortable uh, mm -hmm. traveling to the US as much, but I did get to meet him twice, once in the US and once in Poland. Yeah. That is so amazing. It, the, the resiliency. Yes. I feel like to be a child and to be that resourceful. Right. It's amazing. I, I imagine, yes, I have a daughter who just started her second year of college and I can't imagine happening to her what happened to my grandfather in his second year of college showing up and everything is bombed. Yeah. So, <clears throat> so your grandfather utilized his nine languages right. to navigate being an orphan and then weathering really one of the most horrible wars. And obviously he didn't have any Jewish blood. He was just Polish, right? Right. right. He was Polish Catholic, right? Okay. So what was it after the war that helped him survive? How did language really help him after the war? Right, so after the war, uh, he used his languages to, uh, his knowledge of languages to get a job teaching. So that was, um, that's what he was doing in Poland immediately after the war. And then once he was in Sweden, um, you know, he escaped there illegally. So he had to learn the language there to survive. Otherwise he never would have been able to get my grandmother back. And then he had to learn the language of English in order to immigrate to the US. And so that, that helped him survive there. Um, a little um, secret about the book is it's called How Languages Saved Me, but there were a couple of times that his knowledge of multiple languages got him in trouble. <laughs> because in the workplace, um, especially in um, Sweden and New York City, he would enjoy speaking with other immigrants that were there in their native language, which was usually not Polish, some other language. Um, I think he spoke to some Estonians and he spoke to, in New York, he spoke to a Haitian in French and so, um, he enjoyed doing that, um, but sometimes, I couldn't believe this happened more than once, but he would be at the workplace both in Sweden and New York City, and he would be speaking to some fellow immigrants in their language, and he was talking about his pro-democracy views, his anti-communist views, and not realizing that a couple of his coworkers were actually communist. And he had some attempts on his life, even after the war, 
once in Sweden and once in New York City, kidnapping mm -hmm. attempt in New York City of all places <laughs> because oh, of his pro-democracy views. For so Poland. usually languages helped him. <laughs> but it was his pro-democracy views for Poland. Uh, well, just pro-democracy views in general in New York City, he was talking to a Haitian immigrant that happened to be a communist who told his friends and had the guy, there was a kidnapping attempt on his life the next day at work, the very next oh, day. Wow. And in Sweden, uh, he was working in an iron foundry and he didn't even know that there would be communists in Sweden, but apparently a couple of his coworkers in, in Sweden were communists and they arranged for him to be standing in, in a certain spot in the workplace just when these huge hot iron molds were being poured and it was supposed to be right where he was and at the very last moment one of his friends grabbed him and said get out of the way and and saved his life oh my goodness all because he was you know pro-democracy and and uh, anti-communist <laughs> that's amazing <clears throat> did your grandfather ever get involved in politics other than when he was uh, running for office right after the war, no. Uh, but all of his friends thought he would be great at that after the war, and, and they encouraged him to run for office. Uh, when he was a teacher in Poland shortly after the war, um, he was helping set up the city government because, you know, the, the war had just ended. There, there was no Polish government. So he was working directly with the city council in reestablishing the government. Um, for instance, he would officiate at weddings as a way of helping to reestablish the government there in Poland. And just about a month ago, I received a phone call from a woman in Poland who said that my grandfather officiated at her wedding in 1946 or 1945, just after the war. That's so that was really amazing. She speaks English and, and we had a great talk on the phone and we've been corresponding by mail ever since because this is a part of his life I knew nothing about. So was he ordained? No, I, th I think more, it was more a civil ceremony at the, at the government office. So tell us another one of your favorite stories. Give us a little bit more to uh, intrigue us about your grandfather and his life. Yes, I, I'll tell a little bit about what he was like as a person. He was the kindest man I've ever met. He was uh, extremely, I would say, dignified up, up until the age of 80 he continued to answer the front door wearing a jacket. He would always put on a jacket before he opened the door uh, and he would greet an older lady by kissing her hand. Uh, oh. Just very dignified, sweet man. And yes, if, if, I, could only, uh, <laughs> if I could only speak as many languages as, as, as he could. So amazing. They only had your mother? Your mother was the only child? Yes, uh, they actually, um, they they had another child that passed away so when um okay so they were married in poland in uh, just after the war in 1945 and my grandmother became pregnant soon after that but just two months after the wedding was when he was arrested by the soviet secret police so he did not even realize that she was pregnant when he was put in jail and escaped jail and got all the way to Sweden. So they would write these letters to each other in secret code. And that's how he realized that she was expecting. And, you know, back and forth, all these letters on how he was going to come back and get her. Her parents were saying, forget about this guy. He's in Sweden. He's never coming back for you. There's, you know, there's no chance. And really sad. She ended up giving birth um, alone. He was still in Sweden and the baby died after a couple of days. Um, she didn't get adequate uh, prenatal care because her husband was a fugitive. So she saw a doctor a couple times and the doctor said, you're supposed to, um, you're gonna need to have a C-section. This is a high risk pregnancy. And when it came down to it, the doctor in charge uh, tried to deliver naturally and um, caused some brain damage. So oh. yeah. So they did lose that first baby. So just my mother was their only child uh, that survived. Yeah. Tell me something about your grandmother. Tell me a little bit about this woman who endured such, you, you get married and you would never in a million years think that your life would work out in right. such a dramatic, a movie right. type way. Right, right. Um, people, people that have read the book have told me this, it's just, amazing that you're even here. How did you, <laughs> how did you even come about? My grandmother uh, was a very feisty lady, I would say. Uh, she, she loved to say that um, she was very traditional and she would say, um, the man is the head of the family, but the woman is the neck. <laughs> so, 
she say, so I, I control, you know, which way the neck goes is what she used to say. Um, uh, but she was very feisty and the book includes some letters that they wrote to each other while they were apart when he was in Sweden and she was still in Poland. And, and you can hear in the letters, she, she would say things like, uh, stop being a dreamer. You need to try to come back to Poland, you know, stop dreaming about going in all these other countries and finding a way for a new life. Um, you know, my parents are telling me you're never going to come back for me. And um, another set of letters that I have between them is when they immigrated to New York, my grandfather later on took a job in Monterey at that Defense Language Institute. Well, my grandmother was um, expecting my mother at the time and wasn't able to travel quite yet. So they had to live apart for a few months. And the letters back and forth, uh, her feistiness came out and, and said, you know, you need to move back to New York. And they're telling me California is where all the crazy people live. <laughs> you need to come to your senses and stop being a dreamer. Uh, yeah, there's a great story about how my grandfather got the job in California. So he was working in New York um, at, at lots of um, odd jobs that were usually reserved for pretty low skilled immigrants, you know, the, the lowest of the low. He couldn't get a job um, that would be able to use his language skills. And so one day he was at work and happened to notice a job announcement on his boss's desk for teacher of Polish at the Army Language School in California. So he saw that and thought, oh, my boss knows that I, I know Polish. He's surely going to tell me that about this job. He knows I love to teach. You know, this is perfect for me. So he writes down the information, puts it in his pocket, and, and waits for his boss to tell him about the job. Days go by. The boss never mentions it. So he applies on his own to this job in California and eventually gets the job, has to go back and tell his boss, I'm moving to California. His boss says, yeah, I saw this job, but you don't want to move to California. He said, New York is America, and America is New York. <clears throat> California is where a bunch of wild savages live. These are still wild people jumping from tree to tree. There are not, no American citizens living in California. This was 1951. <laughs> really? Really. <laughs> oh, I've never heard that about, I mean, I know we're the land of the fruits and the nuts to a lot of people. <laughs> Yes, so uh, luckily my grandfather didn't listen to his boss and, and immigrated to California. It ended up being the best thing. Um, he taught at the Defense Language Institute for 35 years. And oh, wow. I like to think that even though he, he wasn't in Poland to see it become free and independent, a democracy as he wanted to when he was running for office, I think he had an even greater impact on that because for 35 years, he taught these American servicemen Polish. And so they spread democracy to all of Eastern Europe from the knowledge that my grandfather taught them. So I think he had an even bigger effect than if he had stayed back in Poland and run for office. That's amazing. So your grandmother had tenacity, which helped her survive, but she didn't always buy into the moving and the, the shifting around. Yes, yes, yes. She thought he was too much of a dreamer, head in the clouds, and needed to be more practical. Yes. yes. How long were they married? They were married for almost 60 years, yes. Uh, we, uh, we went to Rome for their 50th uh, wedding anniversary uh, to, to, to celebrate, and uh, the, the Pope at the time was Pope John Paul II, the Polish Pope, of course. So we had a private audience with the Pope, and that was, both my grandparents thought that was the absolute highlight of their lives. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> to have their marriage. Imagine for a Catholic, yes, that's like the Pope. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I didn't realize he was Polish. Yes, the, uh, John Paul II. Uh, not the current one, but the, the last one. So. That is amazing. Now, share a little bit about your personal favorite memories with your grandfather. Okay. Uh, my grandfather uh, gave me, gave me the, the gift of time. I visited them every summer. I would spend every summer there in Monterey, California, and I would wake up in the morning and my grandparents would say, what do you want to do today, Stephanie? And that's what we did, whatever I wanted to do. So long walks on the beach, um, going to the park, playing games, uh, just the gift of time with my grandparents. That was the best thing that they, they shared with me. And, you know, they always made me feel, feel that I was just the most important thing to them. They were just huge uh, cheerleaders of my success academically. And um, just the gift of time with them is really my favorite memory. 
I guess another specific memory would be going to Poland um, soon after um, it became free again. So it became free in 89. We went in 1992. And going on that trip with my mother and my grandfather was just amazing. My grandmother didn't go because she would never go back to Poland. She was absolutely terrified that he was still on the list to be arrested. And so she was much too scared. But I did go with my grandfather and my mother. And my grandfather was our tour guide. And it was just so sentimental watching him show us all the places where he grew up and um, all these special artifacts, talking about them to us in Polish, um, seeing his face light up. It, it was just um, one of my favorite memories. What a treasure. And how many years did you get to spend summers with them? So from about the time when I was uh, six until um, graduating high school, probably every summer I would go to Monterey and, and spend the summers there. And um, my dad lived there as well. So I would go there every summer. Yeah. I, I had my honeymoon in Monterey. Did I you? Loved that area, yes. Oh, so beautiful nice. there. So now the journey of you going through this with your grandfather, when did he start sharing the stories with you? Yes. So as I mentioned, as a kid, I wasn't unfortunately very interested in history and I didn't, I never really probed or asked about exactly what happened, but I knew that there was something important there. Probably in the early 1990s, I was in graduate school and we started having conversations about uh, publishing his book. And uh -huh. um, that's when we started um, corresponding by mail and he would mail me these handwritten pages or these uh, manually typed pages of his story. And I would transcribe them on the computer. I would call him once a week and we'd go over any questions I had. And that's how we got started. So he retired in 86. So uh, almost a decade after his retirement was when he started writing. And then how long after his passing did it take you to finish? Because yeah. I know you had that gap of right. not doing anything with it. So you right, did 10 right. years with him, he passed, and then you had a gap of how long before you picked right. it back up? Right. So his passing was in 2012, um, and I was um, preoccupied with having younger kids at the time, busy. Um, my mother was diagnosed with stomach cancer in 2015. And so at that point, uh, we just wanted to focus on her life and we traveled the world with her and just, we were more focusing on the present than, than the past. And so didn't work on it too much then. Um, she passed away in 2017 and that's when I was going through the garage and I found all these boxes. So a uh, little over a year to put everything together. Um, wow, that accelerated, didn't yes. it? It was, it was a very busy year, yes, but much of it, as I mentioned, was already written, so a lot of it had already been written. It was integrating all of these um, audio tapes and videotapes, and I actually got in touch with the children of the Swedish family that helped my grandparents as refugees when they escaped World War II Poland. So all of these children are now in their 80s and doing great. And so I connected with one of them, Birgitta in particular, and she gave me a whole nother set of interviews that she had. She interviewed my grandparents about their lives and how they escaped Poland. So that was another set of uh, documents and information and recordings to help write this book. That is amazing. Yeah. I know we had, <clears throat> we had a couple in our church and they were survivors of World War II. And... I believe that they were Polish Jews, <laughs> but we, I had my daughters go with me and we went and had, you know, just lunch with them one day and they shared with us all of these amazing stories of yes. their experience. And, and I don't know that we can imagine right. what these people went through. It's unbelievable. Yes. I, for the research for this book, I've been reading other other people's stories, and I I just I can't even imagine what it must have been like. The things that we complain about in our daily lives are just nothing compared to what they've experienced. Yeah. Yeah, and how so many of these people, you know, survived using, you know, they th they had to think so creatively, right. and they had to be so courageous. Right. Right. You know, and maybe your grandfather and his brother being orphaned so early because they were already in the space of survival. Yes. 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 I hadn't thought of it that way, but you're right. That's probably something that gave him a little bit of an edge. He was already a survivor. Right. Mm -hmm. 
doing what you have to do to survive. Yeah. Not many of these people are alive today. So it's so critical that we get these stories recorded. I hope that hearing this story will inspire people to record their family story, whatever that is. Every family has a story. Now, why did your grandfather have so many recordings? What, what, what created that library of resources? Good question. Um, Because my mother and my mother and I and my grandmother knew that this was an important story. We pushed him over the years <laughs> to, uh, to be interviewed about his life. So uh, in the late 80s, uh, my mother sat down with him and interviewed him um, at our home at Christmas time and, and said, okay, let's start with the beginning of the war and then after the war. And so very methodically went through it that way. And then 10 years later, we hired a videographer, my mother did, to um, to capture anything we might have missed uh, about his entire life story. And then um, the Swedish woman I was telling you about, uh, when she visited my grandparents in the 1990s, she brought an audio tape recorder and said, I want to interview you about your life. And she just hit record and started asking questions. So that was how we had all of, all of those uh, recordings. You know, and we have so much technology now, right? That we could be recording. And, you know, I don't know that anybody when they're living their life sees how extraordinary it actually is. Right. Because they're just doing the life that's in front of them, right? They're not, they're surviving, number one, and nobody's thinking, this is going to make a great story, you know? Exactly. Exactly. (laughs) Living their lives. Right. We can't rely on the person who went through it to, to be the one, you know, family members need to uh, help urge that on. My grandfather kept saying, but I just want to live. I don't, I'm not ready to write yet. I just want to live. <laughs> and that's a great point, but we wanted to preserve it at the same time. Now, what was it about his story that really was important for him to share? What was the drive behind that desire? Why did he want to share it? Mm-hmm. You know, I think he was uh, in part motivated by, he, he would say, the most important women in my life keep pushing me and saying I need to do this, so, so I need to do this. Uh, but I think also his friends, the encouragement of his, his colleagues at work uh, told him that people can learn from your story. And it's hard to learn from history if, if we don't have this written down somewhere. How can we learn from it if we don't preserve it? So I think he was motivated by that. So essentially it was the village the village of his family, huh? Yes, yes. <laughs> he said, um, my grandmother used to tell him, I hate people who don't keep their promises, Ted, and you promised you were going to write this book. So she was always holding that over his head. So he said, um, I really have no choice but to follow through because the three women in my life say that this is how it's going to be. <laughs> <laughs> did he find joy in that journey of sharing it with you, though? He did. He did. I mean, his face would just light up when I would ask him about his life. Um, we'd be on vacation somewhere making videos that uh, we went to Hawaii for his 90th birthday. And I just said, let's talk about some of your war stories. And I turned up, turn the video camera away from my kids and onto him. And uh, his face just lights up when he talks about his life. Yeah. What an incredible legacy though, you know, to, I think these stories are important because they show us the power of the human spirit, you know, the resiliency, the persistence, the way that as much as there were people who thought they were doing the right thing, yes, you know, like the Germans and really recognize that this is just a string of human beings right. doing the life that's in front of them. It doesn't justify their behavior, but you know, right. they were also victims of being told yes. what they were told and believing yes. what they were told because they were so brainwashed. And I'm yes. sure there were some that were, a little bit on the maniacal side and probably sure. <laughs> Hitler sure. would be at the head of that. List. Yes. 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 But yes. it's incredible to think about people who have endured such horrific things and then they go on to have such joyful and full lives. And there's something to that. I was listening to an interview yesterday. Larry King was interviewing somebody and they were talking about that laughter and joy and how in the concentration camps, laughter and humor, and they actually drew comics. And we can't imagine how they could find humor in something like that. But that's the part of the human spirit that actually 
gives people the ability to make it through. Right. 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 There's that light. There's that little bit of light. There's that little bit of hope that lifts them above the darkness and gives them the ability to, <clears throat> to really see the potential, the possibility, you know, the, the way through or the way out. And maybe, maybe it was just the light on the next step for your grandfather. Right. You didn't know how the story was going to end either. Right. You know? Right. Yes. I love the humor in his story. I think that really, really helped me uh, with the journey and knowing that there were some lighthearted moments, even in the, the sad parts. Yeah. How was it for you listening to all of that story? How did that impact you emotionally? Wow. It showed me where I come from. I was like, wow, I, I can't believe what, what my grandparents went through to get here and, and to have a family. I, I just can't believe that I come from that level of perseverance. It's very inspiring when I think about the challenges in my own life. Uh, it gives me the strength to, to overcome some things uh, given what they've had to go through. It's really inspiring. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. What a gift that he's given to you and your family by sharing that story. Because it sounds like he didn't give it the merit that everyone else did. Yes. Yes. But isn't that had... the way it is, right? Yes. We, yes. we don't see our own lives as a magnificent masterpiece. <laughs> We're just doing what we got to do. Right. That's right. So what's your most treasured, what's your most treasured memory or part of this journey of learning this story, compiling this story, piecing it together and finally getting it to print? What's the most treasured part of that journey for you? Wow. Um, I think, um, you know, reconnecting with my Polish heritage has been really, really wonderful. Uh, I've been able to connect with people that knew my grandfather, like this woman that called and uh, said that my grandfather officiated her at her ceremony in 1945. Um, connecting with the daughter of my grandfather's high school girlfriend to learn more about his high school years was truly amazing. So um, being to able to connect with that part of my, my Polish heritage, um, I've been able to speak at some uh, events with some Polish groups, and, and that has made me um, feel even closer to my grandparents, even though they're no longer with us, I'm still part of that, that culture that they celebrated and part of that heritage. That is really neat. And it's a legacy, right? Right, right. You get to see and share in something that was such a big part. And I think it's in our culture, in America, culture speaking, like in a country, we have so many different nationalities and cultures living here. And for someone like me, who's several generations away from immigration, we've lost the cultural habits or the cultural things that hold a person right to their heritage right right i'm just essentially a an american right right but i don't have that like oh we have these traditions from our home country right right like we're just so disconnected from that so i think it's really cool that that circled around for you that you could actually yes. have a connection to a culture that you came from that's a powerful yes. legacy yes I think it also gives um, new meaning to the rituals that, I, that I've done. Uh, for instance, we have this um, tradition of exchanging the apuatek on Christmas Eve, which is the, uh, a communion host that is done at, at home with the family. And now that I, I'm reconnecting with my Polish heritage and, and finding out a lot more about it, it, it gives these rituals that I've done every year since I was a baby uh, more meaning. So that's been a really neat part of it too. So now it actually has almost like value for lack of a better thing. Instead of something that our family does, there's like, right. oh, I understand like it. Wait, huh? Right, right, right. Well, that's wonderful. Well, of course, uh, I want to thank you so much for sharing tidbits from this amazing book and your grandfather and what a wonderful person he sounds like he was. Thank you, Gina. So nice to talk to you. Yes, my pleasure. So friends, as you're listening to this story and Stephanie has shared some fun little pieces of this big picture about one man who had the gift of languages orphaned at age 12, 13 and 
survives World War II, survives immigrating to run for his life, survives two basic kidnap slash <laughs> life-ending events, and goes on to have this amazing family. And his story is one of probably many that need to be told. So if you know someone who has a story, just turn on your phone recorder and get that thing written down. Even if it's a short story, let's begin to share these stories of resilience. And for Stephanie, if you subscribe to my channel below, if you go down into the show notes as well, you will see that I will have a link to her, to her book about her grandfather. So you'll be able to get a copy, share a copy, do a book club. If you're in a historical society, get it in the library. Let's go ahead and get these stories out there so that we can see the power of the human spirit, the resiliency that we all have, you know, and I think you don't know you have it until you're called upon to use it, right? Exactly. All right. Awesome. Well, I want to thank you all for joining us today and Again, don't forget to subscribe below because I don't want you to miss any of these amazing stories. Thanks again, Stephanie, for being with me today. Thank you, Gina. My pleasure. Take care, everyone. Until next week.